Hello, good. Thanks for doing this. No, no worries. Busy day. Yes. Yeah. It's just no, no, no. It's, you know. Uh, we know what it's like. Okay, yeah, so we'll just get things. Rose Jackson, thanks for your time. No worries, good to be here. Uh, the fatal explosion at a social housing property at Wayland last weekend highlighted some concerns of tenants, including complaints about the smell of gas in the past. As the minister, you said that the department would look through some of the maintenance logs. What have you found? So we've managed to get maintenance logs off our contractor and it's important to note that at the moment, under the current contract, all of the management of maintenance is outsourced. So we have to work with the private um, contractor to get access to those logs. There is um, some indication that on two sort of previous instances, there had been issues around the smell of gas on the gas meter. That's at the front of the property. They were quite promptly responded to and, you know, sort of bits were replaced and things were checked. Um, and there doesn't seem to have been, from what our records show, any sort of further issues with that. Um, but we will be fully cooperating with the investigation that the police are obviously undertaking right now to determine what did cause the explosion. And then from there, it's obvious a question of, well, once we know, um, was it preventable? What could we have done? It's just that we don't have um, that full information from the police yet. On paper, at least, from what you've seen, you believe that the, the maintenance jobs were done correctly. That's right. From what I've seen, um, I do have confidence that those two issues that re were reported were very quickly dealt with. And that's, you know, based on having a look at the response times and the reported work done. Just earlier today, I spoke with the mother um, of the young woman who tragically died, um, Mercy, and it was heartbreaking to talk to her about the loss of her, her daughter Jasmine and obviously I expressed the deepest condolences of the New South Wales government. So I take this very seriously, I take this extremely seriously. The ABC has been speaking to some social housing tenants this week who've told us they've been living with rodent infestations that have taken months to address. Uh, some have had their gutters leaking for seven or eight years, uh, whose children are getting sick because of mould in the roof. Um, as the minister responsible, does it embarrass you that these tenants are feeling like second class citizens? Yeah, it does. I, I hate the fact that people in public housing don't feel as though their concerns are listened to and that they're respected by government. Obviously, I do want to emphasise that's a contract that we're changing. From the 1st of July this year, um, I've made the decision to insource all of those points. That's one of the reasons why I redid the maintenance contract. Those stories that you've heard um, they're real. I've heard them myself. The people call my office, write to my office, contact me when I go out and visit public housing. And, you know, we run a sort of pretty heavy triage service through my office, constantly trying to respond to those kind of issues as they come up. And you've been, you've been intervening a few times yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. It shouldn't come to that, though. It shouldn't. I've, every time I do that and my office does that, um, you know, I make a little note that it's good that we've been able to do that, but it should not be that people in public housing have to go all the way to the minister to have basic work done. So there's many people who can't even get into social housing. The, the waiting list for individuals and families, I think, is about 58,000 at the moment. With the budget coming up, what plans do you have to, to try to get that wait list down? Look, I know this is one of, you know, the favourite things that people try and do, you know, get us to, to you know, pre-announce well, budgets. Look, putting but... the budget aside then, <laughs> what are your plans to get that wait list down? Yeah. Because that was a key sort of commitment, yeah, wasn't no. it? Yeah, no. It's build more public housing. I mean, you, you are right to identify the waiting list is very long and we've already done hundreds of vacant restorations, so turning homes that were uninhabitable, the kind of places that you'd see around boarded up, you knew, oh, that's old public housing, you know, left to rot. We fix them up and we have families living in them, but there is more to do, there is more to come. We just have to invest the money to build the homes that we need. It should be seen as essential infrastructure. You know, we, we think nothing of spending hundreds of millions of dollars or more on roads or on transport, and they're very important things, but homes for people to live in are just as important. Are you winning that argument in government? Yeah, I think I am. I think I am. Everyone in government, you know, has got their bit that they're cheering for. The minister, you know, has got their pot that they want to fill. Um, but there is a lot of recognition of how much there is a need in public housing. My real priority, my priority is bringing down the priority wait list. And, you know, I have to be honest, that's the thing that really keeps me up at night. And that's people who are, you know, really in desperate need, at risk of or experiencing homelessness, women and children leaving domestic violence, people with a disability. And that list, which has gone up by almost 15% um, in recent years, is of huge concern to me. So success is bringing that list down. It is also just building new homes. And once the budget's released and we've got a clear understanding of where all of the dollars land, um, I am interested in releasing 
targets for social housing. We've done that for overall housing. We've released our new housing targets and that's good. Um, post budget, we're going to be looking at what our targets might be for new social housing. And I think targets are useful. So yearly targets? Yes, that's yep. right. Yearly completion targets for social housing, because if you don't measure it, you're not really accountable to it. And um, I do want to be accountable for delivering more social housing. The government has acknowledged that we're not building nearly enough homes in New South Wales. Um, it's one of the reasons that the government's zoning for major sort of high rises around railway lines and, and transport hubs. Um, the government had an opportunity to set requirements for developers to contribute to affordable housing. Why was it only 2% when there are so many essential workers that can't afford to live close to work? Yeah, well, it was 2% for the tranche 2 TODs, Transport Oriented Development Zones, it was 15% for the accelerated zones. Is the 2% the gold standard? No. Would I like to see more? Absolutely. But it's a baseline. It's something to work off. And if we set things like affordable housing targets too high, it stops projects getting off the ground. So we're trying to get that balance right. We've set the baseline for the first time. We've said it's a mandate that affordable housing must be in there, and let's see where we can go from there. You're also the Minister for Mental Health. Uh, this week you announced $111 million for community mental health, and a big portion of that was to help people with complex mental health conditions live in the community rather than uh, in mm. hospitals. Um, given the profound shortage of social housing, wh where are you going to house those people? Well, I mean, the reality is there's a range of different options we need. We need social housing for some of those people. Um, but there are people for whom even social housing is not going to work. And, you know, we definitely, as the Minister for Housing, I see the failed interaction of the housing and mental health systems where we have failed tenancies of people in social housing because they're not getting the treatment that they need for mental illness. And so social housing is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. We also need supported, long-term, permanent, 24-7 mental health accommodation. And part of the money that we announced was funding to get that off the ground. On the same day you were making that announcement, uh, an inquiry here at Parliament found that the mental health system was in crisis. Um, it was calling for a complete overhaul, much more funding. So is there more to come for mental health funding in the budget? There is. Um, not necessarily in this budget. I don't want to sort of preempt this budget too much. I really welcome the parliamentary inquiry. I think that's been a great process. I'm going to go through all of those recommendations. And I do give a commitment to the sector that I see and hear their demands. The inquiry also found that police are not really appropriate first responders for people having a mental health crisis. Um, and instead, there should be mental health experts mm. kind of dispatched, potentially even with paramedics mm. like they are in South Australia. Is that a model that you're looking at? Yeah, it is. I thought that was a really interesting finding. I saw some of the evidence of the inquiry in relation to that. Um, that's a piece of work that we'd already started. I do accept that. And the police themselves have actually been fantastic in saying, look, we are not necessarily the right people to be responding to some of these incidents. Of course, if there's a weapon involved, of course, if there's a danger to an individual or to others, you know, we rely on our police as first responders. But a lot of these incidents don't involve that. They involve someone who's struggling with mental illness. Maybe they're behaving erratically, um, you know, sort of talking or acting in a way that's a bit distressing. Um, currently, police are called. They're responding to that. There's no real danger involved. It's just that there's no one else to go. And I do accept that there are good models here in Australia, South Australia, ACT, the UK, the US states, a number of them have different models. We are actively looking at that now through a process that's being done with senior level officers in health and police working together to say, how can we do this differently? It's something that, you know, we're going to be focusing on over the next few months. Rose Jackson, thanks for your time. Love to chat. I actually do love to chat. I'd say it's been quite the week and then every week it seems like it.